Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Charlestown Presbyterian Church. It is wonderful to see you all here this morning. A welcome to those of you who are online, and my profound apologies for the uh, misdirected image you are seeing. We have done absolutely nothing with the way we haven't changed a thing with our technology. Isn't that lovely? For those of you who don't know, they're seeing this. So, didn't change a thing, and there we are. So, we all know how that works, right? Murphy's Law. So, we'll get that worked out. If you can tolerate the image being the way it is, stay with us. If you can't, our apologies. We will try to get that fixed. Alrighty, so some announcements. Uh, two opportunities to uh, be involved with our community are coming up. Hospice of the Panhandle ce celebrates Valentine's Day by thanking their uh, doctors, staff, social workers, pharmacists, funeral directors, all those who help them do what they do. Uh, it used to be by giving them cookies, but because of the pandemic, we are reducing, they are reducing the amount of the ways things are touched, and you know the drill on that. So there's a list of things you can bring next weekend, leave in that basket, and we will get that over to the Hospice of the Panhandle on Monday. So thank you in advance for being part of that. A regular special offering that we participate in is coming up, the Super Bowl of Caring, uh, Sunday, February 13th. Uh, all of that that is collected will go to Community Ministries Food Pantry. So we encourage you to be part of that. There are a number of other important announcements in the bulletin. Please be sure to read those today as you have time. And now let us worship the Lord. Please join me in the call to worship. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and kind in all his works.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. Gracious God, we are so amazed at the gift of salvation you give us freely through your Son, Jesus. You have called us to share your good news with our family, our friends, and our community. We confess, O oh Lord, that we, we have failed to do this. We feel unworthy. We are afraid. We fear the world more than we trust you. Forgive our shortcomings and give us the courage to make disciples by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. children of the congregation to come forward for the children's moment. Anywhere up here is good. All right, I'll come over here. <laughs> so how are y'all doing this morning? Uh, so our scripture for today is about the prophet Jeremiah, and God calls Jeremiah but Jeremiah says, God, I can't do what you want me to do. I'm too young. I'm too afraid. I'm not very good at, doing, at speaking to people. What do you think God says to that? Hmm? You don't really know? No? Well, God says, that's okay. I'll be with you. You can do all these things because I am with you. You don't have to worry about being too young, too afraid, too small. Do you guys ever feel that way sometimes? Like you're too young or too small or too afraid to do things? Mm-hmm. You're afraid of spiders? Yeah, me too. Uh, so, when we get afraid, when we feel like something is too big for us, especially when it comes to helping other people. We should remember that God is with us and that God will help us and that through God we can do wonderful things, just like Jeremiah. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, often we know what you want us to do but we are afraid to do it. We feel like we are not good enough, like we are not strong enough, like we are not big enough. Help us to remember that you are with us and that you are bigger than any obstacle, anything that is in our way. Amen.
excellent anthem choir. Thank you. We have a number of prayer concerns this morning. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Bethany from the choir as she uh, deals with uh, the cancer that she is facing. Uh, we also want to lift up Rachel Tanzel in our prayers. She has COVID. And uh, there are, all, are a number of people in our community that are dealing with COVID, some of whom are hospitalized and some of whom are in uh, very uh, scary circumstances. We do thank you for praying for my mom, dad, and sister. They are on the mend from COVID, so that's great news. Uh, also, we were supposed to have our leadership retreat yesterday. We called that because of the iffy weather and uh, that's next Saturday at 9, but uh, would appreciate your prayers for that, that it would be an event that is both a, a blessing and a renewed call to the ministry we share as a congregation. So let us take our concerns and our joys before the Lord. Loving God, we thank you for the chance to pause in this worship service and lift our concerns before you and to lift our joys. Lord, you work in so many incredible ways. There are so many things for which we must give you thanks, things we often don't even think about. The food we enjoy, the clothes that keep us warm, the houses that keep us from the elements. Lord, there are so many who don't have that. And we pray, O oh Lord, for them, that as we as your church would continue in our efforts to help with those areas of ministry, those areas of importance in the lives of those who don't have those things. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would always be thankful for everything you give us. We thank you, Lord, for bringing healing to those who have asked you for help, those we have been praying for, and Lord, we lift up more today. We pray for Bethany, Lord, that you would be with her in her situation, that you'd watch over her, and that you would give her strength and bring healing to her body. We pray, Lord, for Rachel Tanzel. We pray that she also would experience your healing, that you would watch over her and give her more and more strength each day Bring healing to her from her case of COVID, Lord, and watch over her and protect her. And Lord, there are many, many more we could name who are dealing not only with COVID, but with many other issues. Lord, it is obvious every day that we are in a mental health crisis in this world. So many people just snapping and losing the, their, their grip on reality their grip of what's appropriate, their understanding of where their value and worth is. And we lift up those who are struggling with that, Lord, and pray that they would find their hope in you and that we, your church, would share the good news that would bring hope to those who are struggling with those issues. All of these concerns we bring before you in the name of Jesus the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you are able, I invite you to stand as we sing our next song, We Are Called to Be God's People. It is on the insert in your bulletin.
As we go now to the scriptures, let us first seek God's blessing. Most holy and loving God, we turn our hearts now to your word, and we ask for your spirit to speak to us, to encourage us, to challenge us, help us to hear your voice amidst the amidst the clamor and the chaos of our lives, O oh Lord, that we would be your faithful people. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Our passage today is from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Of course, you will find that passage in the usual places. I'm not going to continue to list them every Sunday. Hopefully by now you know where you can find that passage. Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. and Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week, the world lost an iconic singer an artist whose work was spread out over several decades. He literally had one or two hits in the 70s, in the 80s, and the 90s. And then he spent the last act of his career performing his hits and a little bit of other work in some smaller venues. But he was a big star at one time. And I am speaking, of course, of the artist known as Meatloaf. One of his hits was this goofy love song, You Took the Words Right Out of My Mouth. And my apologies, because for some of you, I have given you an earworm. You are hearing that song in your head right now. I apologize. But however, that song just basically explains that breathtaking experience of finding a person you want to spend time with and be with and do life with, that experience of falling in love and how, at times, it can just leave you speechless. Speechlessness is central to our passage this morning, found in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet, and his call from God came to him when he was just a teenager, maybe 14 to 16 years of age. And when that call comes, Jeremiah says, uh, hey God, you know, I'm just a kid, right? What could I possibly say to your people? But God had plenty for Jeremiah to say. Jeremiah started his ministry under King Josiah of Judah, the last of the truly great and godly kings. This was probably around 627 B.C. Josiah was eight years old himself when he started his reign, so, you know, Jeremiah's kind of an old guy to him. Maybe he thought he had some wisdom, but that doesn't matter because God thinks that Jeremiah has something to say. The people of Judah and Israel had wandered far from God. Our Wednesday night Bible study is looking at the book of Ezekiel right now, a very, very challenging book to study. It explains how 
and why the judgment of God is coming, that the people, after Josiah had allowed so much pagan worship, even in the very temple itself, many other gods other than the God of Israel were worshipped in the exact space that was reserved and dedicated to God himself. And that behavior led to the sanctioning of all kinds of sin, from murder to betrayal to all manner of sexual sin. The people of Israel and Judah had moved about as far away from God as a person could. And so God's method of dealing with his people when they were wayward like this was to send prophets. Now, sometimes the, these prophets provided snippets of the future, but their primary ministry was to proclaim the messages of God in the present and to do so in a way that would convict the people of their sin so that they would repent and seek God, that they would remember the very covenant from which they had strayed. And Jeremiah was one such prophet called to engage in this exact kind of ministry. And given his age and experience, Jeremiah is wondering what God is thinking, picking him, sending him into this kind of ministry. He knows that the people are not going to respond to him kindly. No one likes it when God calls someone out for their sin. And we especially hate it when one of our brothers or sisters in Christ says to us, uh, 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 you shouldn't be doing that. Jeremiah knows how, that, how that's going to go. His question makes sense. God, what could I possibly say to these people? What qualifies me for this? And the answer that God gives is encouraging and wonderful, not only for Jeremiah, but for all of us. God basically tells him that when God calls, God equips now, as people who follow Christ, we also have a calling. After his death and resurrection, Jesus told his followers in Matthew 28, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Our mission as the church of Jesus Christ is simple, to go and make disciples. When people come to faith in Christ, something very interesting usually takes place. Often, if they are older teens or adults, a, a very obvious change happens. And they will step very far away from their old life into their new Christian life. I was raised in the church, but I did not really come to faith in Christ until I was 16. And so when that happened, I stopped listening to all secular music. I only listened to Christian music. My Christian friends became the most important friends I had. For a while, for a long while, I didn't have very many non-Christian friends. I got very, very involved in church. If I could have, I would have been there seven days a week. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of that. In fact, some Christians need that level of devotion to stay faithful to Christ. But it doesn't take much when we are in that kind of environment where it is so safe, especially when the, uh, the uh, judgy eyes of other Christians can make us feel shame for associating with non-Christians or certain on spiritual things, we can possibly, even deliberately, just not get engaged with the world. When we take that too far, guess what happens? We are only engaging with one another, and hardly ever with the world. We stop interacting, and then soon we stop sharing our faith. We stop reaching out. We stop making disciples. 
Since the day I walked into this church almost 17 and a half years ago, the constant refrain I have heard is that we need to grow the church. Friends, Christ did not call us to grow a congregation. He called us to make disciples. So let me say this as clearly as possible. If we focus on growing the church, we will never grow the church. But if we focus on making disciples, the church growth will follow. There's a big difference. For focusing only on growing the congregation, guess who the focus is on? It's on us. But if we are focused on sharing the life-changing, powerful gospel of Jesus Christ, then we're focused on Christ. We're focused on the good news. We're focused on the message. We're focused on the salvation he gives to others. Now, I get it, friends. I get it. When we look at the sin, the immorality, the division, the hostility in the world, the idea of sharing our faith is a downright scary prospect at times. Talking to others about Jesus is a risky proposition, especially in a world that wants everyone to do their own thing. And of course, rule number one, don't offend anybody. But friends, the gospel offends. And so being afraid to share our faith, that's understandable. But we must remember that God is greater than our fear, greater than the challenges the world poses. And we must remember that God can and does change anyone. We have to believe that's possible. I know there are Christians who think that there are certain people beyond saving. That is a sinful attitude. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, that with God, all things are possible. Remember, our job is not conversion. We can't convert anyone. It's not in our power to do that. That belongs to God. Our job, our work, is to get out there and share the good news with others while also nurturing those who are in the faith. But it is God who changes people. And we are privileged, blessed, honored to have such a high calling from God. And so we must step out in faith and go where God leads us. When Jeremiah makes his initial protest to the calling that God has laid out for him, God responds saying to Jeremiah, do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. God promises Jeremiah three things. He will show Jeremiah where to go. He will give Jeremiah the words to say. He will watch over and protect Jeremiah. These three promises are true for every single calling that God gives to every single follower. What to say, where to go, protection. When Ezekiel defeated the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18, Elijah was scared for his life, and he ran. But God protected him. And then God told him where to go next, told him what to say. And his whole ministry, he enjoyed that sense of calling, that sense of purpose, that confidence that God would watch over him. And there are numerous examples of that very thing throughout the scriptures. 
In the Gospels, Jesus is very clear about what his followers can expect. Listen to what Jesus says in John 15, verses 18 through 20. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. It sounds a little scary, doesn't it? I don't mean to be alarmist, but the reality is that the world we live in wants little to do with a God who saves people by his grace and not by their own merit. And what's more, that very God then asks for our submission, that we would obey. Remember the old hymn, it doesn't say, trust what does it say? Trust and obey. Trust and obey. We follow Jesus, we do what he says. But you know what Jesus says after he says those tough words about they hated him, they'll hate us? He said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He's greater than the trouble we might face. The very promises that God gives Jeremiah in his call are the same promises that Jesus gives his followers. And so, in faith, we are to be obedient to the command to go into the world and share his message of love, hope, and salvation. Following Christ is life-giving and life-changing. When we look at how scary and awful the world can be, we ought to not turn away in fear, but that ought to fill us with a sense of grief and sadness, but also a desire, a want that others would know the grace we find in Christ Jesus. The church is called the body of Christ and this is not merely a figurative illustration. We are how the gospel is shared. We are how the world hears the message of the cross and the empty tomb. And if we do not go, people will not hear. As the body, God has organized us each with different parts all of which are part of the mission to share the good news and build people up in their faith. Not all of us are like Jeremiah or Peter or Paul, but all of us have a calling. And that calling is unique and special to each of us. God didn't make Jeremiah go to seminary or a special college to refine his call. Now, yes, some of us do that, but the majority of Christians do not. Yet, every single one of us has a calling. And it is critical that each of us explore that calling and then serve as Christ leads us. In our particular congregation, that sense of serving is even part of our mission statement. Knowing Christ, growing in God's love. I had to look at for, for a second, sorry. That happens, I forget every once in a while. That's just nerves. Growing in God's love, serving as the Holy Spirit leads. It all goes together. Some of, it's not that some of us know Christ, some of us grow in God's love, some of us serve as the Holy Spirit leads. All of us do all of that. Often our particular calling comes out of our passions. Each of us has a slightly different idea of what's important in ministry. I guarantee you that passion is connected to your calling. Some of us have a passion for building up the body of Christ here in the church, maybe through Sunday school. I bet there's a passion for teaching 
and disciple making. Some of us have a passion for going into other parts of the world. You might have a calling to mission work. Some of us might have a specific calling to a particular age group. It's probably a calling to that specific group for ministry. It's all different for each of us. But God will give us the skills. And guess where those skills come from? The church. It's part of the whole disciple-making process. When God calls, God equips. And God will protect us as he leads us. Yesterday, we were supposed to have a leadership retreat, but we postponed it because of weather. We're going for this Saturday. Please keep that retreat in your prayer. But see, the work of all church leadership is very simple. It is to lead the people of the congregation in mission. What's that mission? Make disciples. It's that simple. And like I said earlier, ever since I walked in the door, this congregation has been worried about growth. Again, if we try to grow the church, we will fail. But if we focus on making disciples, God blesses that work. We need to recover our sense of call and mission in Christ. And so I want to suggest a few ways to do that. Number one, prayer. It begins with, in, and through prayer. I urge all of us who are hearing this message today to lift our congregation up in prayer, to ask God to help us recover a sense of calling and mission and purpose, but also that he would give us the courage to be faithful to that call. I cannot overstate how critical that kind of praying is. What do you notice about Jeremiah in the beginning of his call? God didn't say, Jeremiah, go. Off Jeremiah went. He was in conversation with God. And if you read on, there's an ongoing conversation between God and Jeremiah throughout. We have to stay connected to Christ as we seek to do his work. Second, we have to act. We actually have to do the work. That, has, that works in two ways. First, we have to obey the call. Christ says, go here, we go there. When we have some consensus on what God is leading us to do as a congregation, we have to do it. And let me tell you something, friends. Here's what that consensus looks like in prayer. You're praying, you're praying, you're praying. Let me come together at some point, maybe intentionally, maybe casually. And someone says, you know, I really think the Lord is leading us to do X. And someone else says, without having talked to the other person, you know, I've been feeling that way too. That is not something you ever ignore as the body of Christ. So we need some consensus in prayer. When that consensus happens, we need to go. We need to remember that God is leading us and we need, to, we need to do it. We can't sit around and wait. Jesus never said, wait for the people to come in the door. Never said that. He said, go. Go. Do it. Be active. And go we must. Remember, the message of the cross and the empty tomb is a message of hope and life. And we should want people to know the Lord, but we have to tell them. I know that's hard. Some of you know we were without hot water last weekend in the manse. Plumber came over, and I knew this message was coming up. So the plumber and I are talking, and so I took a breath. And I asked him, do you have a place where you regularly worship? And we started talking about his faith journey, not mine, his. That's how you get in that conversation, simple things like that. But if we just clam up and zip it, we're not going anywhere. We're not doing anything. We've got to act. 
we've got to tell people. We have to let God equip us for that, for that work, and that means we need to take the time to learn what our spiritual gifts are. We've not done much of that over the years, but we're going to do more of that in the months and years ahead. We have to, and we're going to. Third, we have to learn and know how to share our faith. I intend to get more in depth on this particular point as well. But the easiest way to do this is to know your personal story. But before I tell you how to do that, let me tell you the absolute worst way to share your faith. Don't get into an online debate on social media with a non-Christian. It doesn't work. Arguments do not change people's minds. But love does. Compassion does. Story does. So know your story. All you need to do is answer a few questions. Why do I follow Christ? What do I believe about him? What was my life like before I knew Jesus Christ as Lord. How did I come to the faith? What has changed for me? If you can answer those questions, you can share your story. And you know what's great about that? Our world values personal stuff, personal stories, personal experience. It's really hard to have an argument over that. That's the starting point. Know your story. Share it with others. Finally, we must be growing in our own faith. This is something we work on personally and as a body of Christ. Part of making disciples means helping one another learn more about what we believe praying together, learning the scriptures together, worshiping together. All of that we do as the body of Christ, we also do it on our own. But a very significant part of our growth as Christ followers is actively engaging in the work he's called us to. Calling is a huge part of personal growth. It strengthens our faith and it clarifies our vision for what Jesus asks of our lives. God put the words right into our mouths, into our hands, into our hearts. At first, Jeremiah did not understand this, and often we don't either. But if we are faithful to God's call, God will equip us. We must seek this call in prayer and then be willing to trust God and be faithful to that calling. We must go. And sometimes that can be scary, but we must trust that God is bigger than our fear and bigger than the evil and sin in the world. This world needs the message of the gospel, and we are the ones who are called to go and share it. What a joy it is to share our faith. So let us work together to seek God's calling, to be equipped for that work, and to learn how to share this life-saving message as we continue to follow Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the calling you place on our lives. And we know, Lord, that sometimes we just don't go. Often, Lord, we could do more. And so, Lord, change that in us. Help us to be faithful to that calling. Help us to want to share your good news. To want to share that love with others. 
Help us to want to go. Equip us for the calling and the work. and Help us to build up disciples for your church and for your kingdom. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us prepare now for the presentation of offerings as Penny plays her musical offering this morning. Great and gracious God, we thank you for all the gifts that you give to us and what a joy it is to give to your work and your kingdom. And we commit these gifts, Lord, to you. And we pray, Lord, that they would be used to make your gospel known. For we commit these gifts to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our final song of the morning is number 749 in the hymnal, Come Live in the Light.
Remember to keep the leadership retreat in prayer and all the many other things that are happening around our community and all those people being sick and all this. And uh, yes, continue to pray about our mission, which we're going to say together here in a second. Friends, as the church of Jesus Christ, go from this place. Amen.